Okay, this is part two of this two-part series because some of you have asked, Pastor Tom, wouldn't it be interesting if you just shared personally, very personally, what Jesus Christ means to you? So that's what I'm doing. Last week, part one, Jesus is my Lord. I embrace that. And Jesus is my Savior. I embrace that. I believe it. Now we've got Jesus Christ, number three, is my teacher and challenger. Uh, because in my opinion, good teachers make you think. And good teachers challenge you. And in my experience, good teachers aren't known right away. They are not necessarily the one you like at first. I think of Mr. Monty in eighth grade. Didn't like him at first. What a marvelous teacher he became because he taught me to think. He taught me to understand history. And I ended up so respecting him. Went back and visited him when I was in high school several times. Couldn't get enough of him. He taught me all about real history, not made-up history, not a history that uh, serves only the one telling it, as we see so often in our culture. Um, but let's be honest, it's challenging to hear from Jesus, our teacher, because, well, what about these words? Do not repay evil with what? Evil. How does that sit with you? Most of the time. Uh, that's challenging for me. My first impulse is not always to be so loving. Well, that's my problem, not yours, I'm sure. Um, what do you pay evil with? Good. Don't repay evil with evil. That's hard enough. But then he says this outrageous thing, but repay evil with good. That takes a little work. Don't take revenge. He said, this is from the Sermon on the Mount. The red letter version of the Bible, Jesus' very words. Don't take revenge, but forgive. Of course, St. Peter said, as I would have said, uh, how many times, Jesus? <laughs> as many as seven, because it was the perfect number. And what did Jesus say? Oh, no, 70 times 70, which is not a mathematical issue. It's forgive endlessly. Whoo, Jesus is my challenger. When you throw a party, don't invite people who can pay you back like the rich. Invite who? The ones who can never repay you. I've done it a few times, but I'll be honest with you, my sisters and brothers at Agnus Day that I love, most of my parties are the friends that I really know and love and we're going to laugh all night. I've done a few of the other ones and I found out what Jesus said is true. They're actually more fulfilling in my life than those other ones, and I love those other ones. Jesus is my teacher and my challenger. How about this? Remember, he said to his disciples, who were making uh, comments about all those evil ones and their enemies along the road, your Father in heaven makes the sun rise on the good and the evil. That's it. On everyone. God doesn't suspend the laws of nature because some people are wicked. Some people meaning a little bit in all of us. He loves the whole world. He's crazy about us, every one of us. When you pray, this one you know, say it like this. Our Father in heaven, hell would be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. How many times have our prayers been all about our wants instead of the kingdom of God? Or a better phrase is the reign of God, which is a reign of love. May your reign of love, God, come into my heart and into the world's heart. That's what we're saying. And I say that because we say, as Lutherans, the Lord's Prayer very often. Good. Think about that. Your kingdom come, not mine. Not this particular understanding of what the world should be like, but your kingdom of love. May it come, may it come. And you know what that does when you say it over and over? It becomes embedded in your heart and you start to work for it, which is what Jesus was doing when he said, pray like this. See? Not for the Red Murray bike that I prayed for a year for when I was in seventh grade. <laughs> Finally got it. Not from God, but my dad. I wore him out. 
How about this? Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Isn't that the American dream, though? To lay it all up on earth. Check that stock market. Yeah, I know people who are addicted to first thing in the morning, and then at noon, and then in the evening. Stock market, stock market, stock market. They're addicted, and they have no joy about it. Even when it goes up a little bit, whatever, whatever those are. I can't even stand to say the names. They're still not happy. Or even better, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the reign of God. Because the reign of God is about love, and the kingdoms of this world are about money and power, hugely. We got a teacher who doesn't pull any punches. Then I love this one. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this wine, you are, now I'm cutting to the chase, you are proclaiming that my life, my style, my witness, my service to the world is the true way of life. And when you have the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation in Holy Communion, Jesus is saying, I will be with you. I will support you. I will empower you. I will forgive you. I love that one. It comforts me. Uh, the others are very challenging, and we need them. That one is a comfort. Jesus gives both challenge and comfort. I am the light. I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the resurrection. These are things that, of all the passages of the Bible, we should take seriously, as Jesus is our teacher. They challenge and comfort me, and I'm glad for both. Jesus doesn't change the facts of life. He changes the way we see the facts of life. He gives us new insights, new vistas. This is what a good teacher does. And he does it all the time. He makes you wonder. He makes me ponder. He makes me take a little moment when my nose is out of joint because something he said I didn't like. That's what good teachers do. And then you discover that teacher was right and the joy floods over you. Okay, Jesus is my teacher and challenger. Number four, and I cheated on this one. There's actually four things in there. <laughs> but I just used it one. This is going to be a little longer. Jesus is my strength my purpose, my hope, and my resurrection. I put them all together. My strength. Jesus is my strength over all the other strength that I can get from all kinds of people. Jesus is number one. And he is my hope. And he is my purpose. Above all other purposes, including making a living, uh, including hot sauce. And that's a hard one for me to say, as you may know. And Jesus is my resurrection. I take my clue from the second lesson. You got it in front of you. Uh, it begins this way. For we have confidence because we walk by faith and not by sight. For the love of Christ urges us on. You think about what Paul is saying here. Does the, does the kind of judgmental attitudes and fear that our, our culture is filled with does that urge you on in life? Or does it just make you angry like it does me? You know, and close down the life of Christ, the resurrected life of Christ that is in all of us. You know, but the love does urge me on, yes. Because we are convinced that one, meaning Jesus, has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all so that we may live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised for us. And then you have that extraordinary verse. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, everything is new. How I need that on certain days to remember every day is a new creation in Christ. The Holy Spirit creating Christ in me, as Galatians says. All the attributes of Christ are being formed in you right now, every day. Yeah, you pick them up sometimes, sometimes you don't. Oh, that's all right. That's the way it is. But he's being formed in you, a new creation. I think about some of the bonehead things I've said to people in the past I regret them, and I'm thankful that 
in Christ now today, there is a new creation taking place. For Tom Aiken to say Jesus is my strength and purpose, my hope and resurrection, means he's not only taught me how to live, but he's empowering me to live it. I need to get off my apathy chair once in a while. I don't know about you. Jesus is poking around, messing around with my, the paradigms of life that I've discovered I think are important. He messes with them. Well, he gets to. <laughs> He's the second person of the Trinity from all time and through all time, as the Nicene Creed says, and beyond all time. He is the one through whom all of us were created, and he is the one God chose us before the foundation of the world in to be holy and blameless before him, blameless in love. Um, you've heard me say that, and I'll say it again, you have taught me so much, all of you in different ways, in the Bible study, oh, by the bucketful, and this, the group has seen me write stuff down. I say, you know, one of these days I'm going to bring up what you said, and I've done it. I don't, don't use any names. I might this time. <laughs> Just the initials. <laughs> Nay, just a letter. This person has a D in his name. So you can get that new directory <laughs> and find out who he is. He might be here. Two weeks ago, he said to me at the door, we talk at the door a lot. He said, you know, Pastor, and these, this is a direct quote because I ran to my office and wrote it down. Actually, I think I wrote it down as he was speaking. I keep my pencil here. We tend to tread on thin ice in everything we do. We don't want to fall. We don't want to create problems and tension. So we don't attempt things at all. Isn't that true at some level in your life? And Jesus says, get off the apathy chair. There's work to be done and the kingdom that you pray for every time you pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Luther said, what that means is may it come through us into the world. That's what we're asking. That we get involved. That we do good deeds. Yes. Motivated by unconditional love. And whether we do them perfectly or not, let it hang. You just do it, see? All right. Um, Jesus encourages me to continue the work of Christ even when it seems disillusioned to us. When it doesn't seem to work. When that person still hasn't caught on to you know, my particular way. Jesus says, behold, I am with you always before he left us physically to the end of the week? To the end of the month? Oh, I forgot. what. It was. To the end of the world the end of time, and then beyond time in the life to come. So his resurrection is a gift to you right now, today. It's already in you, as theologians have pointed out. The resurrection is not just for that time after you go toes up. It's now when we are still living in this world. But it is also when we go toes up, when we finally meet our maker. All right? And... Uh, so we speak against bigotry now. That's the resurrection life in us. We speak against uh, uh, homophobia. We speak against transphobia. We speak against, yes, Christian nationalism, which is, uh, has a playbook called the 2025 playbook. If you read it, it is horrific and terrifying. Jesus isn't found in it at all. But white supremacy is. We speak against it now. Because the resurrection life is in us right now. And the Christ who called us from before the foundation of the world is in us now, strengthening us to do it. And when we make a mistake, he says, you're still mine. Get back out there. Get off the apathy chair. I will be with you. See? Um, so part two of the resurrection, that time at the Supper of the Lamb, when the second person of the Holy Trinity will reconcile, as the scripture says, all things, all creation, all of it. Evil will be destroyed, but all of creation will be reconciled. And the best way I know how to say, say that is, you're going to find this strange, to sing it. <laughs> because we sing it every Sunday. I do. Uh, you, you have to listen to me sing. 
but it's the preface to Holy Communion. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out the fire of your spirit, uniting in one body, people of every nation and tongue. You see how broad that is? And so with Mary Magdalene, first apostle, and with Peter, kind of a rambunctious follower, <laughs> a good guy, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, these crazy creatures, they're all part of God's plan. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. And you all sing, holy, 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 you know how it goes. That's at the Supper of the Lamb. It's a promise where Jesus takes your life and hands it to the Father, hands it to our Creator and says, here you go, Achan. You're going to go to the Father. And he says to the Father, Father, here is Achan. Here is Hines. Here is Thompson. Here is Nussbaum. Here is all the people of the world, just the way you wanted them, reconciled in my loving hand. You have a promise. And it's that resurrection both now and at the end that empowers you, as I've seen you already doing. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Trust the story. Trust Jesus the Christ. And live into it today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>